Hey, what's up guys? My name is Ashona. Welcome back to my game engine series. So last time we talked about resizing, how to handle our application, our window properly resizing. Check out that video if you haven't already. And today we're going to be having a nice little maintenance episode. Whew. I love maintenance episodes, to be honest, because I think that maintaining code is something that is extremely difficult. I think that um, to kind of keep programming and w like without accumulating tech debt is really a challenge. And I think that everyone, even senior engineers struggle with this at times. It's something that you kind of pick up like strategies to mitigate that you kind of pick up throughout your career and you keep building on it. And everyone has their little things that they do to kind of make sure that you're not just programming, 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 because your mind wants to get that stuff down. You want to get stuff to work. You want to actually get a running program down. You want to just put all that code that's in your brain out onto the keyboard and compile it. And you want it to run. You want to build these massive projects that just work. You want to just jam it in. But there comes a time but well, you have to just stop. You have to just think, mm, that stuff that I did really quickly because I couldn't be bothered doing it properly, that stuff that I just wanted to jam in so that my application would run today because I want to see results on the screen today, that, that need, I need to go back to that. I need to fix that up because now my future ideas are going to suffer as a result of me kind of making some, not poor decisions, but just the first iteration of something that I wanted to just get down into my code as quickly as possible so that I could have something cool to show. Everyone has this, right? Not just personal projects, not just people working on personal projects. You can look at game studios, for, for example, right? We have crunch time. Well, obviously the game, the games industry as a whole tries to reduce crunch time, but still we have that time before release where we have a deadline. We have to wrap up this massive project. But the thing is, this project is huge. This project, you know, you, you, you go on like Jira and you see that there's still over a thousand open issues. The QA has just been like, mm, eh, it crashes when you do this, or this isn't supposed to happen, but it does so many different bugs. So what do you do? You go through as many of them as you can and you just patch them up and you don't worry about, well, Technically speaking, I should spend three days working on a proper fix. No, because you have a deadline. You have to finish that stuff up. So this happens to, to large companies. This happens to small companies. This happens to individuals. This happens to people still in uni learning programming. This is something that affects everyone. Um, and whilst we don't really like, we don't have that much tech debt per se, because these, this has not been some kind of marathon, like 48 hour programming challenge in which I've written Hazel from scratch in 48 hours. Um, which obviously I could definitely do, but it probably wouldn't be this good. Um, this is like a kind of step-by-step -step series on how to build a game engine, quote unquote, properly. Um, obviously everything in, shared in this series is completely my opinion. Everyone's going to have different opinions. Think that the more senior someone is, like the more experienced someone is, they're probably going to have like a wildly different opinion and they're going to stick to their opinion. And it's, I think it's hard to come across people who are humble enough to admit that, well, you know, I respect the way that you've done things, even though it's different to me. But ultimately, you know, we've written this in somewhat of a way that I've tried to mitigate tech debt as much as possible, but still down the road, you know, especially me developing my Hazel development branch, which is a much more mature and fully featured kind of, well, not fully featured, but more featured version of Hazel that, um, as a result of me developing that, I've realized obviously that some things were, eh, I've, I've done some things differently there. And that's totally like, that's totally normal because I mean, ultimately speaking, um, if you were to sit down and if you were to rewrite your software project three times, you're not going to probably, you're not going to write it the same way three times. You're going to write the whole thing out first, finished, right? You sit down the second time and you'll be like, I'm going to do things differently. Might be because you just, you, you feel like it. You're just like, I don't want to do the same thing again. That's boring. Right. Might be because along the way of you designing it the first time you've figured out that actually this is a problem. Uh, or it just might be because you've just realized that I could just do this so much better, right? I mean, it does it well the first time, but I, this is a more efficient way of doing this that I've realized because I now have a grasp of the whole pro of the whole problem stuff that you, you kind of just get over time. Right. And so I don't want to like, I don't want to talk too much about this now. Um, I think that is definitely important to consider these things, but because of the fact that I've written it kind of multiple times in a way, I've been like, well, I've done things differently in Hazel dev just because I could really, just because I was like, well, you know, we don't need to do this. There's some stuff in Hazel that's not in Hazel dev. And there's obviously a lot more in Hazel dev that's not in Hazel, but ultimately because it's a more, more complete project. And that's why I wanted to make Hazel dev. I can look back 
um, and actually take things from Hazel Dev and be like, well, you know, it's almost like looking into the future a little bit and being like, well, we're going to have to handle things this way for it to work properly. So let's take some of those back now and check them out. Hazel Dev, by the way, is available to all the patrons that do help support this series. Patreon.com forward slash the churner. If you guys pledge at a certain tier, you'll get access to all of the source code behind Hazel Dev, which is like a fully featured kind of PBR renderer. You know, we've got like animation going on there. We've got basically like a viewer where you can load custom textures, custom models, stuff like that. Definitely check it out and help support the series. Thank you to all the wonderful patrons who do help support the series because you guys are the ones that make this possible. That's why I'm sitting here right now talking to a camera instead of doing something uh, different. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back into this. I wanna just take a look at a few things. Um, well, specifically, I might just describe what we're doing today first, I think. We're gonna just take a look at Hazel. We're just gonna take a look at a bunch of code. I'm, I am I do have some notes, but I'm gonna kind of go off the book here and see what I can do um, because I just want to take a look at Hazel and I want to see what changes need to be made. Um, because there are some things that I want to do, like that I want to just upgrade. For example, we've been using Visual Studio 2017. 2019 has been out for a while, like the official release has been out for a while. And on, you know, Hazel Dev is using 2019. So I just want to basically move Hazel from Visual Studio 2017 to 2019. Um, that's like step one. The other thing is to do with uh, organizing files, essentially. We've got a lot of files and folders that I've, I've basically sorted that out completely differently in Hazel Dev, so I just wanna take a look at that. Um, maybe we'll clean up the actual repository a little bit more. We'll do kind of just maintenance tasks that don't really change the way that Hazel runs. We're not building any new features here, but what we are doing is maintaining what we've already got. We're refining what we've already got. We're organizing it in a little bit of a better manner. And the reason I'm doing this now is because of course, we're about to start this whole 2D renderer thing, which we'll probably do next week, if not the week after. Um, uh, and ultimately it's always good to approach a next kind of large step by just refining what you've already got um, making it so that everything's nicely organized because you don't want to start working on a big feature if the code is kind of a mess. Not that it is a mess, but you know, you still want to, want to get the code to it to as good a place as possible before you start with something else. Let's dive in and take a look at what we need to do to make this stuff happen. So this is the Hazel repository as it appears right now. Um, there are a few things that I would change. Um, well, the first one really is to do with pre-make. So if we take a look at our generate project script file, just open it here in notepad. Um, currently it generates Visual Studio 2017. Now I would like to change this to 2019. Now to do that, we're gonna need a slightly different version of pre-make that we started off with. I think that through a series of pull requests, we have actually, or just like me maybe at one point, I think I did just upgrade pre-make to, uh, to, to the latest version of pre-make, which supports Visual Studio 2019. So it actually, I think, will work with the EXE that is in the repository as it stands. We'll check it out in a minute though. Um, if not, you'll have to go to the pre-make uh, repository. And if you click on releases, so if you're kind of just at, at, the, at the base repository, which is github.com slash pre-make slash pre-make core, which is what this is. If you click on releases here, where it says 19 releases, um, you'll see this kind of pre-make 5.0 alpha 14. This is just the latest version, happens to be from the 6th of May. Uh, it does support Visual Studio 2019. I'm not sure where they added support for, for 2019. Um, it was definitely at some point, um, at some point recently. But anyway, if you just basically go down to the bottom of this under assets and you download the premake 5.0 alpha 14 windows.zip file, that will contain the exe file. And of course, if you're running this on Mac or Linux, even though we don't officially support that, um, it shouldn't be too much work to make that stuff work because everything we've written so far has been cross-platform. Um, you might need to set up like GLFW to compile for Mac or Linux and stuff like that. Um, and in fact, I will stay tuned because if you're interested in other platforms, very, very soon we're gonna start supporting both Mac and Linux. That's literally like, I mean, th this year for sure. So I'm definitely gonna add support for that officially through Premake. Um, and just fix up everything else so that we do get everything building. And I do actually want to add continuous integration to this engine as well so that every commit is like compiled and validated on Windows, Mac and Linux. So we are going to officially support those platforms for those of you interested. Um, none of the code we've actually written has been Windows specific at all. I've made sure of that. We do have like Windows window, for example, .cvp, and we've got all of that stuff that looks like it's Windows only, but it just uses GLFW. Um, there's nothing really that I've written that's like specifically Win32 API only. So because of that, you should be able to take all of the code from Hazel yourself right now and compile it on Mac or Linux. The only problems I can see 
and I might be wrong because I haven't tried, but the only problems that I can see are the fact that my pre-make file that I wrote for GLFW, I believe that's only, um, that, that only supports Windows because I've only compiled the Windows files there. But if you just, instead of compiling the Windows files, if you compile it for Mac or Linux by just including those files instead, um, or taking a look at, you know, you could also try to download just a GLFW binary essentially for that, um, you should be okay. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at right now with platforms, but don't worry, that will be coming very soon. So that's kind of the idea. Um, download that if you haven't already, and then you'll have to unzip it and put it into, we store this in vendor bin premake, and then the premake5.exe file. Um, so if we're gonna go back here to Hazel, and if we run generate projects now that we've changed it to be VS 2019, let's see if that actually works. Okay, so it does say error, no such action, VS 2019. So that means that we don't actually have the right version of Premake. So I actually thought that we did, but we didn't. So um, it's hard to keep track, I think, between what we actually have and not because of that Hazel dev branch. So what I'll do is I'll download basically everything that I just said I'm gonna do now, uh, cause we don't have that. So I've downloaded it. I've copied that Premake5.exe file, vendor bin Premake, paste it in here, replace the file. And that is it. That is as simple as it is. Just generate projects again. And you can see that this time it's actually gonna build everything. Now, I really don't like this if error level like pause thing because you can see that I wanted to actually see the output there, but it disappeared because it was successful. Um, I don't like that. I always wanna see the output of this. So what I wanna do is actually just get rid of that. That was accepted during a pull request, but I'm going back on that um, because I just wanna, I wanna actually see everything. Sorry, I forgot to, I forgot to pause. Um, so let's hit generate projects again and you can see that this time it works. Um, so, uh, and specifically I wanted to see, um, so 2017 should also work. If I run generate projects with 2017, you can see everything here gets uh, created successfully. Um, and then of course, if we go back to 2019, we should be able to generate whatever you're using. So Hazel as, um, as it stands right now today, I'm gonna have that support 2019. So basically you should be downloading Visual Studio 2019 to develop with Hazel. If you really, if you don't have 2019 right now or you wanna test it with 2017 or whatever, um, then you'll have to edit this file and change it to 2017 or 2015 or whatever it is that you're using over here. So officially Hazel from this point forward requires Visual Studio 2019. Okay, cool. So speaking of which, this is a bat file. It's a batch file, right? It's something that is clearly Windows only. So I don't like that because I've just started talking about different platforms and how Hazel is totally cross-platform, but this batch file clearly is not. It's a Windows batch file. So what I want to do is a few things. First of all, I want to rename it. I want to call this like win, you know, maybe build. Well, I don't want to call it build because that implies compiling. So just win and then maybe generate or gen projects. Okay. Win gen projects. That's it. And I don't want to leave it here. I want to, I want to make a, um, a scripts folder for all of the different scripts we'll have and we'll pop this here, okay? And we can expand this in the future when we have like, you know, Mac OS or Linux or whatever, we could have like a, you know, like a Linux um, or a POSIX, you know, gen projects, you know, Mac, Mac OS, you know, gen projects, whatever it is that we do for different platforms, we can have, have it there. Obviously there'll be like SH files and not batch files, but you kind of get the point. Um, that way we kind of, um, we can see what scripts are meant for Windows. And then in the future, when we have a lot, we could even separate this into like separate folders, but I'm not gonna do that now because we literally have one batch file. Um, and if we have three, for example, that's not gonna be an issue either. I think that in the future, it's gonna be important to also, um, you know, for like CI purposes, continuous integration purposes, we might wanna have like a build project or so build, you know, solution or something like that, um, which is a, which will basically, maybe it will generate projects as well. I'm not sure if that's required. Um, but basically build solution will just literally just call MS build and build that solution um, so that you don't even have to open Visual Studio to build everything and to get an exe file out of that. So um, that's kind of what I'm gonna do with scripts in the future, but for now that, that's that. Now this isn't gonna work because we moved it. So make sure that you basically go back and you change this to be, to go back a directory and call premake. Otherwise that's not gonna work. So if I try this, um, the other thing is we're actually gonna get no premake script file found of course, because we need to be in a different directory. I like to just do this by doing push uh, D, so push directory, then we'll basically push the back directory and then we'll pop it at the end. Um, so what this will do is basically, you know, do a CD, like a change directory to that previous thing, but it will remember the directory you're currently in so that you can then when you pop it, 
um, it'll actually go back to the directory you're currently in. So at this point, we're actually in the scripts directory. We're back in the scripts directory for here, in case we want to run other scripts or do anything like that. So we have a push D, pop D, and then we call vendor bin premake, blah, blah, blah. So now if I double click on this, you can see that we should have um, everything happening here, and we do. And I will actually turn echo off um, so that we get a little bit of some cleaner output, as you can see here. Okay, cool, beautiful, done. I like that a lot. That script has been fixed a little bit and refined, looking good. So um, let's think about what else we need. Um, so, you know, stuff like pre-make files, we could move into like a build folder. I'm not gonna bother with that. I don't mind having it in the root directory. Let's go ahead and open this because now it's Visual Studio 2019. Does that even work? Let's take a look. Okay, so it's opening with 2017, that's fantastic. Um, I need to definitely fix uh, what I opened my solution files in. So we can basically open this with the Microsoft Visual Studio version selector if we really want to. Um, that way it will select based on, it'll read the file I think a little bit and then select the appropriate version of Visual Studio. So now we're using 2019, which is pretty cool. I just installed it on this computer like just then. So I like don't know exactly at what state this is in. Um, like, yeah, you can see my Solution Explorer is on the wrong side and all that kind of stuff, so, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, cool. So the first thing I want to do, so we're in debug x64, is just build the whole solution. I'm going to make sure that everything runs and actually compiles um, it for, uh, for Visual Studio 2019. I think that a lot of people see upgrading a Visual Studio version as not a big deal. Like, oh, the new one's out, I'll, I'll just get the new one. For small projects, that probably is the case, but in, rea in reality, um, it can be a pain to upgrade a version of Visual Studio, especially if you're working on a huge project. The reason is that you're not just upgrading Visual Studio, the IDE, you're upgrading the whole compiler. And compilers have bugs, believe it or not. Like, it's very common in a huge code base where you've got a lot of code, a lot of legacy code, a lot of like maybe templates or macros or things like that, for your program, for your projects, for your solution to just not compile with a new version of Visual Studio. Like it'll just say that like, you know, internal compiler error or whatever, and you, it'll just, the compiler will crash. Like that happens, especially with new releases. Um, so that's why it's important to like first test everything, make sure it works. This is Hazel, this is tiny right now, this code base. We're not worried about this at all. But in the future, if you're working on more serious projects, that just keep that in mind that upgrading your Visual Studio version is not actually as trivial as it might seem. Anyway, as expected, this did succeed uh, successfully. Um, well, succeed successfully is a great, a great little phrase there by me. But um, <laughs> everything did compile successfully, and you can see that we can launch this. We can move everything around, and it looks pretty good. So that is that. Let's quickly talk about um, the folder structure of things because that's the other thing that I wanted to change. So if we take a look at Hazel, um, what we have here in source is we have Hazel and then we have a whole bunch of stuff here in the root Hazel directory. And we have like time step and core. Not something I want, not something I intended to have. It's just a lot of stuff was made within here, right? So application, core, entry point, input, key codes, layers, you know, log, mouse button codes, orthographic camera controller, maybe not, but like everything here, everything apart from orthographic camera controller is core, right? That stuff is just the stuff that we have in core. Orthographic camera controller we can put in renderer perhaps. Um, like, I mean, it's not the, the best thing maybe to put it into renderer just because like ultimately speaking, it's a controller. It's not to do with rendering. Um, it's to do with like the application kind of layers and stuff like that. So I'll put it here just because there's no place, there's no other place for it. I don't think it fits into anything else here whatsoever. Um, I don't want to put it into core either, but ultimately that's like the one that I'm questioning, orthographic camera controller. Orthographic camera should definitely be in renderer, but maybe not the controller. So going back to core, um, yeah, like that looks pretty good to me. Um, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of making folders, like a lot of folders. Um, not a big fan of making a lot of files either. You can see that I've grouped stuff in buffer, for example. Um, so I don't want to make core, you know, application layers, whatever. No, we're just going to have core and just a bunch of files here. Unless this gets to like a hundred files and it just looks like completely messy and unmanageable, I'm not going to change that because that's just kind of my opinion. Um, cool. Okay. Now that we've done this, we should rerun the pre-make script file and then we'll have to fix all of our include parts. So let's rerun that, go back to Visual Studio, reload all. Um, and then we'll just basically try and compile and we'll, all the errors that we get, we will just go through and fix.
All right, so looking at the output, um, well, the PCH failed, so I don't think it's going to continue. But Hazel Log is now Hazel Core Log, of course, and I'll just zoom in a little bit because this version of Visual Studio changed a few things. Um, well, it just forgot my preferences. And then Hazel Application, for example. So this stuff uh, all becomes part of Core. Um, time step was already in there. This stuff becomes part of Core, except for the orthographic camera controller there, which is in the renderer. Um, let's see what else. Uh, entry point is now in core as well. Okay, let's build everything again. This is just kind of like a rinse and repeat process. We're just gonna kind of build it um, every time and we'll just, we'll let the compiler find the errors for us instead of just manually looking through every file. Um, but I do expect we will probably have a lot because whenever you move folders like this, that tends to be the case. So core layer, layer stack can't find something either, so core. Um, might re rename this to something like base in the future, we'll see, just because it's called base in um, in the Hazel development branch. Uh, but just because, um, and this is a little bit slow here, just because, um, you know, core.h, core slash core.h doesn't sound great, and also it's kind of just a base header file that we want to include almost everywhere. Okay, core. Uh, yeah, see, as you can see, core is included in a lot of places. It contains like macros that we use like all the time. I don't think we need these everywhere. Back when we had Hazel API, it was used everywhere. Um, but I don't think that we necessarily need to have it everywhere now like we did before. Anyway, um, so this is core input now. This is core window. I'm not putting window in renderer because it's not part of the renderer. Technically, you should be able to render to anything, not necessarily a window. So that's why I'm not putting it there. Um, let's try build again. That looks pretty good to me. I think we've fixed most of them. Okay, we've got a few more in, in, in input. So core layer stack. Um, oops, in the middle of compiling that, I guess. Still compiling that. Um, okay, cool. Back to output, um, application.h. We'll just fix all of these errors here. Both of these. Uh, Hazel core layer stack, that's correct, right? I'm not sure why I'm still complaining about that. Hazel core layer stack, that should be okay. Okay, so to save you guys from watching me uh, fix all these errors slowly, I've just gone ahead and fixed all of them. You can see everything compiles successfully now. Let's go ahead and run it again with these changes, and of course we should get Hazel opening as normal. Um, the other thing that's really important to test is all of your configurations. So we have release. We don't really support dist right now. I'm not even sure if it will compile. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, we're not distributing Hazel just yet. We're not just distributing any applications made with Hazel just yet. So I'm not gonna worry about that, but release is definitely important. We'll make sure that that compiles. We've only got one platform, um, so we don't need to do that, but just it, really important. When you do change things like this, do not just compile debug. I can't tell you how many times people have committed code, like at work in the past, for example, um, and they've only tried compiling it in debug and not release. It doesn't even compile and release, or it doesn't work properly in release. So make sure that you test all of your configurations before you commit. Um, do I do this? No. Uh, you know, especially on like a project like Hazel, I'm just like, ah, you know, it's easy to fix, it's, it's fine. But if you are actually working on a project that's important and, you know, it's a, kind of, you, you want it to actually be like, as you want your code to be as high quality as possible, make sure that you just take a, take a step back and just test it in debug and release or whatever other configurations you have so that you don't have to check it in and then just have this, you know, this, this the continuous integration just be like, your commit did not build because that's, that's just embarrassing. No one wants that. All right, so this is successful, of course, and I'll just run it in release as well. And as you can see, there we have release running uh, correctly. Okay, so that's gonna wrap up this episode. Just a few maintenance things that I wanted to get out of the way. Of course, there's many, many more. There's a lot of pull requests that I need to actually look at. There's a lot of other things that I'm sure I would clean up and change, such as looking through all of the compiler warnings. That's gonna be your guys' job. I've given you the task. What I want you guys to do is actually go ahead and uh, pull the latest version of Hazel, pull this all of the stuff that I've done, which I will commit, and then take a look at all of the warnings that you actually get as a result of compiling Hazel and see if you can fix all of them. That's gonna be your task. There's, there's a few tricky ones in there. Most of them should be pretty straightforward. And then when you fixed all the warnings, go ahead and open a pull request in the Hazel repository and I will accept it. And then we'll have Hazel warning free. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button. Also check out patreon.com forward slash the show if you wanna support this series. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye. Phew. <laughs>